to control ease. So I'll actually go over here, Harry, if you don't mind, if you want to get started, I'll just be over here. Okay, welcome everyone. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Uh, given the kind of hybrid virtual nature of, of our, oh, we do have a flag in here. Okay, we'll begin uh, by standing for the pledge, at least those members who are here. I pledge allegiance to the flag like of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. First our item of business is to approve the agenda for tonight's meeting. Can I have a motion to approve the agenda, please? Also, I'll, I'll second. Okay. Is there any any discussion, additions, or deletions to the minutes recommended? Okay, there being none, all those in favor of approval, please say aye. 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 Any objections, please say no. Okay, the agenda is approved. And as you saw in the agenda, this meeting will consist of two parts. We'll do our regular business. Um, meeting as we start and then Dave will lead us through the first step of our goal setting process. Uh, the first item on the agenda is the report of the district superintendent. So Dave, we turn it to you. Thank you. Just one second. Share a screen. Uh, for those of you who are beaming in, I know maybe you can't quite see me, but I'm over here at the computer. Uh, I will step in and out. We'd like to start our functions with uh, the display of our um, vision and mission that we worked so hard on uh, this past year. I should say mission right there, uh, there on, on the slide. Uh, but if you recall, we revised the vision and mission statements uh, with the help of our component partners in January. And uh, that discussion, or these statements, will certainly be uh, guiding our discussion of our goals tonight. But starting with my uh, my report, uh, you know, emphasizing the areas that uh, stood out as. Making sure some folks are muted uh, so that we can we can uh, have our discussion. Uh, that, that drove the, the, the mission and vision really our tagline to be a, a partner advocate and leader uh, in the HFM region. Uh, and, and I use these areas to points of emphasis to guide my discussions with you each month. Uh, and under the umbrella of partner advocacy and leadership uh, over the past month. Uh, we've engaged in, in a number of activities, uh, <clears throat> one of which uh, as, as, as a partner, and I believe as a, as a leader in the region, I worked with the Oppenheim to create a St. Johnsville Board of Education and their new superintendent, Adam Harris, uh, at their first meeting together on July 15th, uh, conducted a board retreat where we, we talked about uh, many of the things that this board engaged with last year. Uh, that, I, that I feel were, were strong practices and, and just focused in on, on the, the roles of governance uh, that should define, define a healthy board on uh, superintendent relationship. Actually shared with them our goal setting process that we're going to go through uh, later tonight. There was some interest uh, from that board uh, to receive some support uh, from our organization later in the year and also shared with them the norms and protocols uh, that we agreed to last year that uh, are in your uh, in the, the board docs folder for your review uh, tonight. I'm going to project them in, in just a minute. Actually, I'm going to copy out for you uh, to discuss if there's any adjustments uh, that you'd like to see in how we communicate with one another and how we operate. We use those norms and communication protocols throughout uh, the 1920 school district. Uh, to define how we would work with one another. Uh, if you look at the first page, the norms, it just kind of sets out the expectations for uh, 
uh, what we feel are, are best practices around the respectful, productive uh, relationship between uh, between the board and uh, the administrative team, and also starts to, to define the, the rules and how uh, we can we can ensure that there's a productive flow of information uh, from the organization to uh, to the board of education. So. Uh, for everyone but, but Gus, this is a, a document that was familiar to you um, on the first page where it talks about the norms. Uh, don't know if anyone cares to comment on uh, how this has helped us communicate uh, in, in the past year. If there are areas <coughs> that uh, we were especially faithful to or not faithful to uh, that, that we should look to improve upon. Uh, and then on the, on the other side, it just those communication norms speaks to things like our Friday report um, and, and how we communicate on and off. I feel uh, like uh, from my end, the, the way the board uh, communicated to me was, was more than fair uh, and productive and certainly was respectful as, as we talked about in this document. But I turn it over to the board if you'd like to have, make any comments on the norms and, and communication programs. I'd make one comment uh, because it was it was an item that was kind of relevant to me, uh, having to do with the um, with the communication protocols, um, where we would we would receive the agenda on a Friday, and our expectation would be that clarifying questions or or concerns would be directed to you or Lori in your absence. Um, and for the board members who've been sitting on the board, you would know that there were times at meetings when I might ask a number of questions on a particular uh, agenda night. Uh, what this really trained me to do was to, you know, really kind of focus, focus very clearly early on in terms of the board documents, uh, knowing that, you know, I was not going to have that kind of last minute uh, opportunity at a board meeting to kind of get that clarification. Um, I think that made me better prepared for meetings. So I think, you know, that that item I think was particularly useful uh, to me because I always thought, well, I could wing it if I don't, if I don't have the, if I don't quite understand this, I'm going to get my answer at the board meeting. It's not quite fair sometimes to ask those questions to you and Lori, uh, you know, without you having the opportunity to prepare and to you know kind of fully uh, be able to answer our questions. So I think that made our board more, at least me as a board member, more um, uh, more thoughtful of the work that you guys have to do. And if I have a need for information, understanding that I don't have to wait you know five days to get that answer. So I think that was a, a real improvement for, for me. We, we appreciate that, but really the, the motivation behind it is it gives us an opportunity to give you uh, the most complete answer that, that we can. I mean, I can always tell you I'll come back when I, when I get more information for you, but if I know prior to the board meeting, uh, we can get you that complete answer. So, so I appreciate that. The collegiality, I guess, to, to yeah. and trust. You know, the other concern that I that I wrestled, it's not a concern, the other item I wrestled with is the, we've gone over your technique, well actually we started this with Anita, and we chose to continue with you, and that is the use of the consent agenda for many of the items on our meeting. To the public, it might appear that we're, you know, I mean, we understand that our role is to review the materials received on Friday, take any issues to you, or you and or Lori, and be fully prepared to act on those items. The thing that I wrestle with, you know, from time to time, and we actually had a discussion with this, I think, back when Joanne was president, um, as we talked about the consent agenda, is is sometimes we may give the impression that the board is, you know, that a meeting maybe doesn't fully uh, explore the agenda topics, because while we have explored them. Uh, we, we might not. So I think we also want to be sure to be, even though we have a consent agenda, be sure that we feel free to, you know, bring up items that either for our clarification or the clarification of those people who are attending our meetings um, 
understand that we really are not rubber stamping items, that we're not, you know, just, you know, agreeing and kind of en masse to the agenda items on the floor, but that those have been studied. So I always kind of go back and forth in my mind as to how much of that uh, should be consent agendas um, and how much of it should be more of an open discussion. We've taken kind of the notion here that most personnel items, you know, are going to be consent. Most of the business items will be, and then the business items tend to be more of an open discussion item. So I think it's a, a real efficient way to run a meeting, but I think we always want to be sure that uh, the public understands that we are doing the, the work behind the scenes and that we're not just a rubber stamp uh, to whatever you know our, our executive leadership team is bringing to us. I, I, I agree. Uh, I, I agree, and I, li I like to have the things ahead of time so we can review them, look them over. But I do miss some of the discussion sometimes. So, what, perhaps adding to the, uh, I think that would actually fall under the, the operating norms. Uh, perhaps we need to flush out uh, how we're going to utilize the consent agenda with, with an emphasis on the idea that any item can be pulled out of the, the consent agenda for discussion. Uh, certainly it is, it is uh, the consent agenda is used to, to take care of kind of the mundane uh, issues that, that may, be, may be there so that you're not unnecessarily making motion after motion. Uh, but any, any item can be pulled out for, for further discussion. I, you know, I'm happy to put something together and we can uh, we take a look at that and maybe agree on these norms at the August meeting. Okay. That, that helped, John? Does that address your? Yeah, that, that, that would help a lot because there was a lot of input. Um, I'm, I've heard from uh, people that opened my eyes to some things. I, I'm, I'm glad I heard their discussions. Good. Okay. Uh, if there are no other comments on the, on the uh, board norms and communication protocols, um, I will bring an amended uh, document back to you at the August meeting. And of course, you know, you can always uh, contact me with, with any questions or concerns about, about this document. Um, so just going through uh, what, what is happening, uh, the district superintendents, uh, my, my group, 37 colleagues, uh, we, we have, like everyone else, been uh, meeting beyond our monthly meetings uh, in a virtual environment uh, since March, uh, you know, regular weekly, multiple times a week for a while there, it was every day, um, but, but it was all virtual. Uh, we actually will have our first in-person meeting uh, in Albany on Monday and Tuesday. It's optional in person. Uh, I plan to attend. Uh, we're, we're not going to have a meeting uh, where we typically do at the, state, at the state education department because if you have ever been in the room, as Lori has, uh, it is not a socially distant environment. Uh, so, so Anita has volunteered uh, her facility at Capital Region BOCES. So I'll be traveling to Monday or to Albany Monday and Tuesday. Uh, as we await uh, the governor's uh, decision on uh, if New York is in a position to, to reopen schools, that will come uh, on Monday. I emailed you uh, last night individually about, I, I don't like to surprise the board, so I gave you uh, some information uh, about a retirement consideration. Uh, I, I was approached uh, by the, uh, the president of the, the teachers union to ask if we would consider allowing teachers who are eligible to retire, who are have the requisite number of years of service and are at least 55 years old, uh, to, to go ahead and retire and waive one, uh, one item, one article in, in the contract that would, would allow them to receive a buyout of their their sick time is a contractual right. Um, typically, uh, you know, they would they would work the entire school year. Uh, it's not a situation where it's something we budget for. It's in a reserve account, uh, so so there really isn't a financial uh, impact on us 
that, that uh, causes us to go looking uh, looking for, for any money. Uh, we'll require an MOA to suggest it's a one-time deal. It does not involve more than one or two people. Uh, you know, we often operate where, where I give you as much information as I can, but I think the board also asks for recommendations from me. Uh, I think in, in this environment, uh, if someone has, has given a, a 30 year career uh, as an educator and they're deciding they, they'd like to step away, uh, I'd hate to stand in their way, but that's what my recommendation would be to allow uh, our attorney uh, to, to draft a, a memorandum of agreement that you could act on uh, at, at the next meeting um, that, that would allow uh, allow us to waive that one article this one time in their contract. But don't know if anyone has any questions. I would, I was, first thing I thought came into my mind was setting the precedent, but I see that's Real. You guys are already ahead of me on that. And uh, the fact that uh, Kathy says we can, we have the money in the right place to do it. Yes. I'm in. So, okay. okay so, I, I think one of the one of the things we should always consider as we look at retirement incentives is the the uh, payback that's achieved with the incentive, because technically here we're going to advance money that we typically wouldn't at, at least would not spend at this time. We're probably going to spend it, let's say, a year from now, you know, when they can meet the times. So I think the um, the idea of um, the incentive is is a great idea. I think, though, as the screening committees begin to do their work, that it's really important to look at um, the best talent we can get who are who would be available to. On the low on the low end of the salary schedule, the payback really in terms of retirement incentive comes in the breakage that you have between the exiting employee and the, the entering one. So I'm um, I'm supportive of the concept, but I would urge you know that we look for the best candidate with the least amount of, of uh, I don't want to say of experience, but the least uh, outlay for us, right? Which I know is probably the practice anyway, but I think there it becomes to the people who are funding our budget, you know, the component districts, it be, really becomes a win for them in the sense that our, our median salaries, you know, actually can begin to go down if we use incentives like that. Yeah, and this is separate from uh, there, there is an incentive in, uh, in their contract for the first year that they're eligible. We're not talking about that, that doesn't apply here. Uh, we're, so, we're simply talking about the article where there's a uh, buyout at a, at a very reduced rate for, for their accumulated sick leave. Right, well, I will, uh, I will get to work on that because it sounds like, uh, at least in concept, uh, the board is receptive. Uh, and we will uh, work on a, a memorandum and bring it to the board in office. And the next thing is where, uh, the next item is where we've been living for the last uh, month or so. Uh, demystifying, deconstructing, uh, whatever we want to call it, the guidance that has come to uh, school districts and BOCES about reopening uh, in the fall. I think everyone is, is aware uh, that we are required to uh, submit uh, at least a link to our reopening plan and then answer uh, 16 pages worth of, of assurance questions about what's contained in our plans. Uh, so that applies both for uh, for the 37 BOCES in the state and the 762 school districts uh, in the state are all, all required to do these plans. So we've been balancing supporting the region and uh, answering questions and helping facilitate the development of their plans while we are also uh, charged with making sure that our organization has a plan that meets each of those assurances. So what I thought we would do is ask Jay and Lori uh, to, to walk us through internally what we've done and I can talk a bit about the external support but these are the assurances that I, that I spoke to you about. There are a number of questions that we have to, to attest to in the, in the uh, business portal, in the, in the state education department's business portal around 
community and family engagement, health and safety facilities, right on down to uh, you know, teaching and learning, special education through evaluation and certification, um, and, and other issues related to uh, regulations. If you remember, there were uh, four regional discussions around the state that uh, centered around regulatory relief and best practices that might be uh, implemented to support the, the development of these plans in a, in a way that allows schools to successfully transition to uh, either in-person learning, uh, remote learning, or hybrid of the two. So we've been hard at work uh, focusing in on, on all of these topics and uh, transition to this slide here. And on the left is uh, what we've done internally and on the right, uh, kind of how we've, we've gone about uh, supporting uh, our groups externally. Uh, before I turn it over, we'll kind of go right back to the left to uh, Jay, Lori, and Kathy, because they've uh, really done the, the bulk of the facilitation internally here while I've been working with, with the components. Um, you know, when I, when I talk about regular communication, you know, I have been uh, throughout, throughout the closure, uh, kind of mirroring what's happened with, with the district superintendents meeting statewide uh, much more frequently. We've been doing the same thing in our region. Uh, with the 15 component school superintendents. Uh, and each time uh, I have a statewide call with, with the other district superintendents and the state, ed, uh, state education department uh, staff, I follow it up with a meeting with our component schools, but then we even go beyond that. We've, we've met at least weekly. And, and as I said, you know, going back to, to April and May, those were, those were daily discussions as as the situation was just even more fluid than it, than it is right now. Uh, recently, what, what's occurred in, in our region as, as we've started to work with, with the questions that uh, were required to be answered in the plans, there's been, been another layer of, of collaboration. Um, our neighboring BOCES, you know, Questar 3 BOCES, well, it's not three anymore, Questar BOCES on the other side of Albany, uh, Capital Region BOCES, and then the Washington Warren, uh, Washington Saratoga Warren uh, OCs as well. Uh, we've been having some, some discussions uh, among the four DSs that have led to some topical uh, roundtables amongst our regions. Uh, Lori's been involved in a, in a human resources, uh, Lori and Aaron in a human resources discussion. Jay uh, and Mike DeMezza sat in and actually, to a certain degree, led a discussion around uh, what CPE can look like. We've also uh, developed stronger relationships uh, with, with the local departments of health. We have to submit two plans, uh, or, or submit our plan in two places. We have to submit to the state education department. We also have to submit uh, to the Department of Health uh, as we are making assurances that, that our plan is in alignment with the expectations that the State Department of Health have put out for safety. Uh, reopening of schools. And in all of these, these discussions, we've, uh, well, not in all of them, in, in our discussions, uh, we've broken, broken out into groups uh, and, and focused in on these specific topics. And I'm, I'm very proud of the, the superintendents in the region uh, as, you know, they are doing this work in the face of, of, of uh, kind of an unforgiving uh, situation where, where they, 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 there are going to be constituents that they just can't please, however the plans are developed, but they've been put in a difficult, difficult situation to answer questions on how to safely and effectively open schools in three different environments, remote, in-person, and blended, and they've worked together. Uh, each school has uh, unique aspects of, of their own uh, plans that they'll be releasing this week, but there are some some commonalities. But you know, all of our school districts don't have the same uh, resources and makeup, so there there are going to be differences. So they they work very hard, as have their uh, administrative teams, faculty, staff, 
stakeholders in, 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 their, uh, in their local districts and those plans are going to be released. Uh, the governor will be determining next week if we forge ahead uh, with, with those reopening plans. But the idea is that all of these plans are living documents and that's why uh, we are simply answering these assurances that the concerns are being addressed, uh, but we are simply giving a web link to our plans because those plans are likely to be edited uh, as the month of August turns into September, turns into October, uh, conditions will change, uh, but you can be proud of the work that's, that's occurred in the region. I'd like to let uh, Jay and Kathy and Lori talk about how our organization has addressed each assurance in, in the different divisions. Uh, and start off with, with Lori talking. Um, you know, she's probably going to need some support from Kathy uh, as we talk about uh, how we built our, our health and safety plan and uh, the other the other pertinent areas uh, in both these operations. So I'll turn it over to you, Lori. Okay. So the assurances that Dave mentioned, the pages of them, we counted and added them. There are 89 assurances that Dave will have to check off and in the affirmative that we have addressed them in the plan. So this is one portion of my reopening binder. Kathy's is a little fatter, but I have two of these. I have a different one in the office of the other material. So there's a, there's a lot of material that we would we would read through. So those plans, as Dave mentioned, were based upon guidance that we received from the CDC, from the Department of Health, from New York State, um, from the health safety risk management people around the state. They provided guidance data, provided guidance pages and pages, um, which I, I, when I look at them now and I think about how much work those folks put in to provide that information to us. And it's really remarkable in a really short turnaround time to make sure we were able to put the plans together. So Kathy is, uh, has direct reports for Jessica Kirby Barnes, our health, health uh, safety um, person and um, facilities, John Willoughby, our facilities director, uh, Darla Sanford, our, our food service director and then transportation, which John Willoughby is also overseeing now that he's joined our team, that there are a lot of assurances in each of those sections, particularly health and safety and in facilities. Uh, transportation, quite a few. Uh, nutrition, not quite as many. But we needed to make sure that when we have Dave check those off in the portal um, on Thursday, Friday, when we're done with the plan, that we can confirm for him that those things are really addressed. Every one of those items is addressed and it. It goes to PPE, uh, protective personal equipment, so people are safe. It goes to, are we providing in other languages information about food for children and their families? Um, it ranges to how are we screening children and adults when they come into our programs? There are so many things that needed to be thought about and included in there, absent even just the programmatic pieces for each of our children programs, each of our student programs, which Jay will speak about in just a minute. Um, we, we had to talk about social distancing. Um, we had to talk about um, cleaning and disinfecting, which is huge piece to make sure that, that other children coming into rooms are, have, are coming into a clean and sanitized environment that from the, a group that might have been there in the beginning. Not all of our programs are doing the same thing, but we're trying globally for the operations of the organization to make sure that all of those practices to keep people as safe as they can be are included in the plan. Cass, do you want to add to those pieces? No, I, well, I mean, I think you know, we've gone through so many scenarios and there are, same with the districts, everything is a little bit different. Our program, each program is a little bit different. So, you know, globally, we're trying to have standards set in place, but then not everything is exactly the same for every program within OCs. And while we're focusing on K-12, because that's really what the state education department is, we have asked our adults and corrections ed um, coordinator to help put a plan together because we also have to provide safe environments for the adults who are coming to us. 
um, for learning. Um, corrections said, well, really just follow the rules that the jail tells us that we have to do. I've worked with um, the school library system and our instructional resource center. We provide districts with so many resources and materials over the course of the school year. We have to make sure that all of those items are disinfected and sanitized before they go to other students in other districts. So we're putting all those protocols and practices in place. Uh, it's a lot, and I have to say everybody has been so cooperative about saying this is we will make sure these things happen. We will make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to keep everybody in a really good place. Um, we have an HR section and Aaron is on Aaron's on here on the on the video, but we had to make sure that we're following our APPR plan, that we're still following all the other rules that we always follow about hiring people with the right certifications and uh, making sure that our itinerant staff who are working in districts are following the guidelines that the districts are providing as well as making sure that they're providing the instruction um, and the other um, support services to students that we're required to provide as the districts contract with us for all of that support. So it, it's a lot, it's been a lot of work, but please understand that our document will be pretty lengthy. I think Dave, by the time we get it all done, but it addresses all of those 89 assurances that state ed will be checking to make sure that our plan has addressed each of those issues. So Jay has been uh, working with, with teams from uh, all of our school-based programs. So I'll turn it over to Jay and talk about uh, how, how we've gone about uh, developing answers to all the, the assurances that are required in our student programs. Thank you. Um, so our administrative team over the past nine days has done a tremendous <laughs> amount of work. Um, so I really want to thank ADK, Chris Carioto, and Rick Potter, um, PTAC, Matt Davis, and CTE, Mike DeMeza, and Riley O'Malley. Um, so we first met on Monday, July 20th, looked at the, the, the guidance documents. Um, Mike Jacob also convened the special education team um, as well on, on Monday. And we reviewed the guidance documents, um, had conversations about how there's commonality in some areas, and then there's going to be uniqueness depending on, on the programs. So the intention was for that week, uh, between Wednesday the 22nd and Friday the 24th, once the uh, administrators had created some, some guidance based on their own needs, shared that with their own teachers in their departments, as well as the uh, families, parents, as many as they could, uh, to get their feedback between um, among those three days. And then we reconvened uh, on Thursday the 23rd. We hosted a video conference for our school district administrators, our component school colleagues. So we had almost a dozen colleagues on that call to share what our plan was at that time, received some feedback from them. We also shared our draft. We created a Google slide and shared that draft with the principals and the superintendents so they could see it if they could not attend the meeting. On Friday the 24th, we reviewed the assurances to see if we were in line with what was being asked and to, to assure that we could meet, meet those criteria. And we also went through the, more definitively the, the commonalities and the uniquenesses based on our department's needs. Um, this past Monday, um, we met with Sarah Barenko uh, virtually with our administrative team as well as our school nurses to get their input uh, from the, you know, the health and safety aspects to ensure we were in, uh, in line and then tomorrow at one o'clock we intend our team intends to uh, review the final draft before we submit it uh, friday and to make sure that we have the assurances in place and through through all of this uh craig clark has been and uh, instrumental as, as we just keep on dumping information on him and he's putting it in the, in, in, into a very uh, coherent format uh, for, for presentation. And uh, we made the decision that we would have one link, one plan uh, for, for HFM BOCES. Everything will be in there and there, there will be a logical 
Mac to get to, to, to the information that, that you may be interested in. But any questions for uh, Lori or Kathy or Jay or myself? Uh, yeah, I, I've got a question. I hate to even bring this up, but where do we stand on liability? In case a student you, gets sick or a teacher gets sick um, because they're in, in school. Well, I, I think unless I, I would, let me, let me take a breath. <laughs> we, we've been directed to open schools unless the governor says not to. Um, we have made these assurances, and I think if uh, we are implementing our plan that satisfies these assurances with fidelity, um, we're, we're doing the, the uh, you know, we're acting within the, the, the spirit of the, the governor's directive. So I think we're as, as solid as we can be, um, but I don't think that there's a, there's a choice otherwise other than to, to make our best effort to be as faithful as we can to the guidance we've been given. I, I agree. I just wanted to make sure the question was asked. That's all. Yeah. Um, and turnaround time, if a teacher gets sick, um, what's the turnaround time to get a substitute teacher in that classroom? So a teacher who calls in sick, John, or a teacher that's called in, calls in during the school day? I'm thinking of a teacher that comes down with COVID. And I don't think it's any a different process than uh, okay. what, what we have in place now with, with the substitute service. But those are all things as time goes on when we talk about the plan being a living document, there may be some sort of accommodations that that have to be made, but the, the plans are, uh, the ink is let alone dry, it's not uh, been put to paper in some, in some cases right now. I, I understand. Thank you for all the work. Oh, I'm happy to do it. So if there are no other questions, we'll continue with our agenda. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, Jean. I want to follow up on John's question. He talked about a uh, teacher being out with COVID, but I came up with this question. What about the daily need for substitutes? When uh, something unexpected happens and the teacher says uh, the night before the morning of and needs a substitute right then, how is that being addressed? Same as it always is. Uh, we, we, we have the substitute service. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand uh, how there would be a different process right now than, than how we operate right now with the substitute service. Will there be a shortage of substitutes? There already is. Is it going to be exacerbated by this situation? Uh, exponentially it will be because as uncomfortable as many of our employees are coming back, I'm sure that there are substitute teachers who have the same type of concerns. So this is a very difficult situation where there, there aren't easy answers. And that's uh, what I alluded to with, with the, the difficult position that, that schools have been, have been put in, but we, that's what we've signed up for. And we will uh, problem solve and look to improve our plan as time, as time evolves. Uh, but right now, I think our, our plan is to uh, operate with, this, with the substitute service as we typically have. Any other questions? So I want to turn it over to Lori for, for a, a quick discussion around uh, the Staff Curriculum Development Network in New York State that uh, she's been part of for years. Um, you can see in, in the projection, it is the, the instructional leadership arm of uh, the BOCES and the Big Five School Consortiums. And I will uh, let Lori talk to you a little bit about uh, what they have been doing and what is planned for uh, 2021. So for those of you who have been on the board for a while, or um, if you reflect back a few years ago, um, the New York State applied for the race to the top money 
and we received, you know, millions and millions of dollars to help support instructional um, improvement in the state. And when the money went away, the group that I belong to said, well, just because the race of the top money went away, we still, we still have a need to make sure we're providing leadership in terms of ELA and math and science and social studies, which were the big changes um, at that time. And so the group said, we're going to continue on with this process. And we formed a statewide framework group. And it's expanded over the years. And now it includes art and it includes um, early learning and social emotional learning. It also includes now um, TLE, teacher leader effectiveness. And that's really the piece I wanted to talk to you about for a few minutes I came I came back from, I say that we had a virtual meeting. Uh, I came back from a virtual meeting last week with um, our TLE group, and it was uh, a, an amazing session. It was only two hours. It was facilitated by two educators um, from Buffalo City School District, and it was the equity bias and anti-racism conversations in classrooms. And so they use Zoom as a platform. And what we did was we had, um, we watched video, um, they provided us some statistics, we had breakout discussions. But what was amazing to me was how much they addressed the issue of those conversations are uncomfortable for people and we just need to know that we'll be uncomfortable, but just because they are uncomfortable that we shouldn't ignore them. And that they came, there were four different um, protocols that we should think about that while we're experiencing discomfort, we should stay engaged in the conversation. Um, I've heard this said before to speak your truth. And I always think, what do people mean? Like, why would anybody lie? But really what we're refer referring to when you speak the truth is really how you feel about something or what you believe rather than what you expect somebody else wants to hear. Not that anybody's ever been guilty of that before, right? Because sometimes we say things, yes, that, that suit looks wonderful on you, or that, those shoes are lovely, even if you may not necessarily think so. Um, but that these conversations that we will be having with teachers and students um, are ongoing. There, there's like no definitive answer for all of this, but it's really about um, our own implicit biases about many things. Um, messy rooms, messy desks, um, how people, what they wear on their feet, you know, might uh, give you an impression about somebody. It's an implicit bias, right? It doesn't have to be about other big, huge pieces, but we need to look at those and recognize them. So Jay will remember because I, he, he's become my evidence person all the time because he'll say, Lori, this is this and here I can provide evidence because he knows that's an issue of mine. We, Opinions are great, um, but we should be able to provide evidence about certain things with the bias, and I'm aware of it, and it's good for us to be aware of our own biases about things. The other thing that I wanted to share with you just very quickly tonight is they've scheduled seven sessions, not around that topic only, um, but the first session was about APPR, and we had Alex Tricolinos, who is an attorney who works for the State Education Department, to talk about the changes in APPR. Um, that will be coming down the pipe. We are still required to meet all of the requirements in our APPR plans. That's one of the assurances, and I know it's in the plan. David, I actually looked at that assurance the other day, and I said, yes, it's in there. I know because we wrote it. Um, it it's in there. I saw it, and so we're able to do that. The next sessions are two days in August, and again, when I say I'll be going, I'll be sitting at my computer in a virtual environment, but attending with that group is usually between 70 and 100 different people attend from around the state. Uh, it's, it's a very powerful group. And um, they'll be talking about um, cultivating emotional resilience. And that's an issue that we've been worried about with our students who have been home from school since March and coming back into an environment and they're young and they're afraid. They're afraid to come back maybe to school. They're afraid not to see their friends. They're afraid that they might be home again. Um, for a period of time this year. So how do we build that resilience in children and in adults, really, um, that things change and, and how can we manage those feelings and still be productive? We're also going to be taking this anti-racism um, practices in the classroom that we did last week 
to take it from the conversation that we had into practices. What would practices look like in a classroom if you're the teacher? How would you address issues that might come up from students in, in your classroom and use it as a teaching moment um, rather than a disciplinary moment? Because that's really what we we're trying to do is to teach everyone. So those implicit biases. In October, we're doing social emotional learning for leaders because while we're supporting other people, we also need to support ourselves. So we have an assistant superintendent at um, Putnam, um, Lynn Allen is going to do that session. And she, she used to work for Brad Alvin for years ago. She was, uh, based her, her initial was school psychologist and Lynn is, is amazing and she'll be doing a great, great uh, program for us. And then we have other sessions scheduled for October, uh, later in October, December, and then in March. So the anticipation is the March meeting might be face to face in Albany, like we usually have it. Um, and it actually would be our third annual um, professional learning conference. And that's for all of the people that belong in this organization. And we typically share best practices that we are using and say, look, this really worked really well in our, in our BOCES area. Here's how we did it. Why don't you try this in yours if it works for you? So it, it's the people in this group are amazing. I'm thrilled that I have been able to be associated with this group for the years that I've been in BOCES. I won't say that number right now. And um, it's some of the best minds in education coming together and supporting each other. And not only the best thinking, but the best sharing. And that's what I think I find most powerful about working at BOCES and being parts of these organizations is the power of the sharing and that we're willing to share and not saying, no, no, I'm not doing this for you. So if you need further details about any of those programs as I participate in them, I'm more than happy to share. Thank you, Dr. Ziskin and Dr. Bruce. Back over to Dr. Brooks. Okay, thanks, Lori, uh, everyone, for the reports. Uh, the next item on the agenda are the personnel items, and it is our practice to approve those as a consent agenda. So I'd like to entertain a motion to approve items A through J under number five personnel. I'll move that. I'll second. Uh, do we have anyone who has any questions about any of the particulars of those agenda items? Okay, there being no questions, all those in favor of approving items A through J of the personnel, please say aye. 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 Anyone op opposed, please say no. Okay, that motion passes unanimously. Moving on to the agenda, we have the business items A through F, and it is our practice to approve those items as a con consent agenda. Uh, I'd like a motion to approve items A um, through F for business items. Jean? I'll second. And Alan? Does anyone have any questions about any of the business items that are about to be approved? Okay, there being no questions, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 <laughs> anyone op opposed, please say no. Okay, that's approved uh, unanimously. <clears throat> the next item on the agenda is the begins the second part of our uh, meeting, and that's the our annual goal setting process. So, Dave, we're going back to you now. So again, the mission, the vision, and the mission. Um, Uh, it's our desire uh, 
to be a valued partner, advocate, and leader in our region. Uh, that's kind of our ideal, the vision. And then our mission is uh, to lead and collaborate to provide efficient, innovative programs and services responding to the needs of our school communities. And the, how we've operated uh, in the past, especially this, this past year, as we've, uh, as we've considered annual goals, uh, we've, we've made a commitment to ensure that they are aligned to and driven by uh, our mission and vision. Uh, and I'd like to just review a bit how we went about setting the annual goals uh, in 2019-20, uh, referring to it as our framework. Uh, remember, in, in, you should have the document, uh, I can project the document. If, if you recall, we talked about setting broad uh, organizational goals um, and allowing and asking uh, the, the district superintendent the executive team uh, and the school teams to ensure that we support the, the direction that uh, the board has identified in measurable ways. Uh, so I will work with, with my team and uh, subsequently they will work with those in the, in the, uh, in the school programs and in the different divisions uh, to support SMART goals that we, we design. And just as a review, a SMART goal is strategic, it's targeted, um, uh, measurable, uh, attainable, a realistic goal, it's result -oriented, results oriented, and it's time bound. And we uh, set SMART goals and developed action plans this past school year, and I've got one of them that, that I want to project for you just as a, as a review of how we went about, uh, went about doing this in, in at least up until uh, mid-March and then and into April when, when COVID changed all of our lives. Um, I can just pause for a second. I know it's a little awkward going back and forth between, uh, between everything. But... So this was one of our SMART goals. Um, if, you, if you recall, we, we set an organizational goal to improve and enhance communication within our organization and with our component districts and partners. And our first goal uh, in 1920 uh, was to build a clear understanding of uh, the HFFO's mission among stakeholders uh, by June of 2020. And how we went about doing that is uh, outlined here. When I talk about SMART goals, this framework here or this, this, this uh, template allows us to ensure that, that we are remaining faithful to the goal. We're identifying folks that are responsible uh, for uh, the faithful uh, design and implementation of, of the goals. And it's time bound, as you can see, uh, by the third column. And then we look for evidence to ensure that it was completed and impact uh, and had an impact. In this particular case, uh, working with our component school districts, not just to understand our mission, but to help us clarify the mission was what we set out to do. And uh, we do have uh, these, these templates, smart goal templates and plans, action plans for each of our 1920 goals. Uh, if the board would, would indulge me, I'd like to bring uh, you know, those completed templates to you at our, at our next meeting. Uh, tonight, kind of focusing in on uh, developing targeted, area, targeted areas for uh, the 2021 school year. Uh, and we will start off with a blank, uh, a blank action, action plan template here. Uh, that operates with, with the uh, idea that we're going to design SMART goals. And uh, we will both talk about what we did in 1920 and what we plan to do in 2021 as we move forward. And someday we are going to get a little better at this. Maybe that's going to be a goal. <laughs> <laughs> a personal growth goal. 
So there's our framework, and ultimately we arrive at, at the folks, the boots on the ground are the ones responsible for uh, designing and implementing uh, the action plans to, to support our SMART goals. And even, I, I, I hope we get to the point where within each division, uh, they come up with their own ideas for SMART goals to support the direction that, that the board sets for the organization. Uh, that's where, you know, there's, there's really a a respectful uh, inclusion of, of the folks that work in our organization as true partners, uh, rather than, than simply a top down, this is what you will do this year. Uh, what, what the board is doing is this is where we feel we, we need to improve. We ask you to help us get there. You know, we value your, your opinions and expertise and, and, and ask you to engage with us during the planning process. So we can look at this uh, as one of those trendy, trendy words, a theory of action. All a theory of action is, is an if and then statement. And what we're suggesting is if we improve in the, uh, in the areas designated by the board, then we will realize our vision or continue to realize our vision to be a valued partner, uh, advocate, and leader in the region. Uh, you know, and I feel like we have endeavored to do that throughout this crisis, and I think to, to a large degree we've been successful. Uh, an old, old friend of mine often said, uh, you can't rest on your laurels and do nothing. You can't stay the same. You either get better or you get worse because conditions are going to change. So we want to continually strive uh, to realize our vision. So uh, essentially that's what I said in red. You know, we will continue to be a value partner in uh, we are successful. So we spent a great deal of time uh, with the development of that vision and mission in our core beliefs this past school year, and we arrived at three areas, partnership, advocacy, uh, and leadership. And I thought we could take some time uh, for, for the board to have a discussion uh, through those lenses of potential goal areas where, where you would like to see an emphasis of our efforts and improvement in 1920. And then there certainly is, uh, if, if need be, uh, the opportunity to suggest areas that maybe don't fit within those three categories. But for instance, and I took uh, the liberty to operate the way we did last year, uh, potential goal areas, if we were looking at partnership, advocacy, and leadership, perhaps the board would like to discuss with, with us tonight or in the future, how and where you would like to see us improve as a partner uh, around health and safety, as a partner uh, with, with institutions of higher education that, that we already work with to improve uh, our partnerships with industry and business. And these are just uh, suggestions for me that were, were obvious ones. Um, did the same thing for advocacy. You kind of see a re recurring theme there with health and safety with your crisis that we're currently facing. Uh, I, I certainly think it has to be at the forefront uh, of our thoughts and efforts uh, as, as we navigate this, this crisis. And uh, you know, these are just areas, as, as I discussed with the executive team, of possibilities. Certainly, we want to be a leader in the area. Uh, how can we lead in a way that actually is, is relevant and, and assists our school partners and the communities they serve? Well, if we can help lead the way towards uh, improvements in health and safety, remote learning, social emotional learning, mentoring and identifying new leaders, I think that those are, are areas if we were to design uh, SMART goals and implement action plans to support those SMART goals, uh, we, we probably would be operating in a way that's faithful to our, our vision and mission. But those are just possibilities. Uh, it's the board's direction that, that you set. Uh, but uh, I think it, it does work better if, if we come in with, with, with a few things on paper. And uh, we will uh, certainly be taking notes tonight as you, as you have a discussion on areas where you'd like to see improvement. So I'll turn it over to the board.
So I guess what Dave is proposing then is that we keep the three broad areas um, as the kind of the organizing theme of, of our goal setting process. And that may be within each of those broad areas. We identify some sub goals. He's put some that uh, he and his team uh, see as priorities. So we would, I would just throw out the idea, does anyone see any, does anyone have any objection if we stay to the three priority areas? And if not, do you see, uh, do you either endorse items that Dave has suggested or do you see other additions that we could? I, uh, Jane? Um, this would be an overall suggestion. All of these things are very important and I think they should have more focus on them to the public who read the local newspapers, get information on the radio or TV. I like to see a lot of these things as they happen become newsworthy so that there's a, a, a public awareness of where we're going and what our goals are. We're going to do this with our component districts, but I'm talking about the wider community. I think that would be a good thing to be uh, focusing on when there are uh, events and certain changes that we're going to be promoting that we have to follow up on. But the public knows about them in a different, in the same way we are learning about them. So that would be my suggestion. Okay. Yeah, that's a great idea. Um, I know we, uh, I think Ashley does a particularly good job at reporting our meetings, but I think it's also what I'm hearing Jean say, is it's part of our responsibility to be able to get um, information out to the public in a variety of sources, one being the media, uh, and then kind of internally so that people do understand what happens at BOCES and what is the role that we're playing in these three areas. So it's a great idea, Jean. Well, I'm thinking also it could be done in a very system so that it's not just once in a while when we remember, but in an ongoing plan. So that's part of what we're doing overall. So I guess what you're saying is that a smart goal dealing with communication overall uh, would help to get us to what you're suggesting then, right, Jane? Yeah. You got that, Dave? Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to, to verbalize uh, my, my understanding of it. So as, as we develop a targeted area for improvement, there should also be a corresponding plan uh, to communicate that focus to the region and, and periodically update our progress. I think that's what I'm trying to say. Repeating it as I'm thinking about it. So yeah, because if we do that, we got a lot of places covered that really need to be tuned into what's going on here. Because as I said before, a lot of people that still don't know what happens through grossing. Yeah, that's good. Anyone else have any suggestions uh, relative to the either the broad areas or specific items within areas? One thing that I'm that I'm thinking of as I look at partnerships <clears throat> is kind of the partnerships that we're proposing there are are the traditional partnerships that you know schools would see as you know kind of naturally existing partnerships. I'm wondering if there's uh, if there's room to explore the maybe more non-traditional partnerships such as uh, if we looked at those social support agencies that are serving many of the children who are either in the Pomona districts or are coming here as students, um, you know, would it be, would it promote their agenda and ours if we had better partnerships? I'm thinking of, um, just off the top of my head, the, um, a group that, I, that I'm uh, sometimes involved in is the Salvation Army. And, <clears throat> I've talked with them about their interest in helping uh, clients attend adult programs here, knowing that gainful employment is, you know, is, is really one of the 
the goals that they have and one of the services that we that we promote. And if we looked at, if we could kind of uh, inventory those agencies that are serving the public that, you know, really only connect to, with us, they connect with us at school because their clients, you know, attend school. But yet we don't really get a, a good partnership sometimes. Um, I'm thinking that may be something uh, that we might want to explore. The other item that came to mind came out of Lori's report where she was talking about that statewide group that you have and the focus that you have on kind of inclusive schools. Um, you know, certainly in the, the kind of the climate of, you know, of society, um, that may be I, and I know, I know it's going to be a topic for your group, but I'm thinking of that maybe as a leadership item where we assist schools with the resources that they need to engage faculty and staff and students uh, in you know, exploring what those topics mean. Particularly, I think it's important in upstate New York where you know, we, we may not have the same uh, awareness of the issues that might exist if we were in other locations in, in our world. So that, you know, I don't want to add too many things to the agenda, but I do see it as a topic, Lori, that your your group's already identified and uh, was, is probably a topic that would be one that we should begin to, you know, really formally address in our setting and help through leadership uh, to uh, communicate those ideas and, and provide the resources across the region. I, I would see that area as not adding to, but kind of clarifying, um, you know, how we're going to go about this. I think that fits. I think you're absolutely right under leadership. And if we were going to talk about social and emotional learning, uh, you know, discussions around uh, recognizing bias uh, certainly fits fits there under under those types but, of those yeah. supports. Yeah, that may be where it goes. I, I, I have 70 plus years old eyes here, so I wasn't quite seeing what was up there. Uh, but yeah, I think that's um, that's a good uh, that would be a good place for it without you know kind of duplicating thing too much. Well, well, I just want to clear if, if we're on the right path because if we, if we want to do something different, we can. Your 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 first comment. Um, about inventorying the agencies I wrote that support vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. Is that accurate? So, so I think that that's kind of an advocacy effort or an advocacy goal. Okay, I like that. And then, you know, the only other thing I'm thinking is something that we're already doing, um, but yet may want to be uh, formalized that, I mean, you know, what we're really doing here is, state is, is exploring the concept that goals, goals really are not, are rarely accomplished in a year. So much of what you started, Dave, you and your team, uh, becomes the basis of where, you know, where we're, where we're going to continue. Uh, However, some goals may be more short term, and I think that, you know, part of the action tonight was to look at kind of structurally how our BOCES is organized and how can we gain the greatest efficiency, you know, by uh, how we deploy personnel, you know, your, your administrative staffing plan uh, was rolled out. Uh, I think that may be as we look at the divisions of BOCES, that that may be something that kind of as a, sh as a short term goal, it, it may be something that, that may have to be delayed because, you know, this is not going to be a typical school year probably, but either this year or, or, or in a subsequent year, relying on the, the division leaders to kind of do that same view within divisions to see, you know, are there greater efficiencies uh, that can be achieved if we reimagine how we're we're deployed. You know, we as a BOCES, I mean, I was in this BOCES in 1979, and from 1979 until 2019, quite a few years, we pretty much organized the way we 
we've been pretty much organized the way we've been organized. And then because of the work of you and your team, we're looking at this next school year as a, you know, a, a pretty different way of doing business. Uh, applying that same concept to the other divisions may be, uh, you know, this may be a good time to do it if, you know, we can manage it with all of the other the other items or pick a, a, a division or two so that over a course of you know a fairly short amount of time a year or two uh, we can look at CTE as an example you know how is that organized is it the most is it uh, as efficient as it can be I'm not necessarily looking to to downsize but yet you know a lot of times we you know we um, become committed to the individuals in the organization and not necessarily the, the needs of the organization. So we, we looked at special ed, uh, CTE, when adult ed, um, and did that, did what you did, you know, on a broad level. I think that that, you know, may lead us to, to look at it in a new way where over the years we've kind of done what we've always done. Uh, so that, that may be a short term, it's, a, it's kind of outside of your three areas, I, I guess, but uh, we may want to think about that. But it's, it's very consistent with not just our mission, but the, the mission of the of New York uh, that, that really is grounded in, in providing efficient, effective programs. So, so I think, you know, part, part of the reason we reorganized really the driving force beyond those, we didn't, we didn't go out and bring in a whole bunch of new people we just refocus people on, on, on specific areas because we think we'll be more effective. So, so you know, perhaps within uh, our organization internally, it might make sense. And that's as you were talking, Dr. Brooks. I kept on thinking of the Bosies of New York mission that talks about efficiency and effectiveness. And if we ask our divisions to continually look at and reflect upon how they do business through through those lenses. Uh, certainly, it's going gonna, it's gonna to improve the, the uh, work we do for our, for our constituents, for our component districts. I think it falls under the leadership thing, too, because, you know, the part of what I, I was assuming in, your, in the plan that you presented for reorganization was kind of uh, expecting more of, of, our, uh, of the members of your team in terms of responsibility for those areas that they administer. Um, and it really is empowering, I think, to the directors to be able to, to you know, guide their programs um, and take more ownership. So I think that it can, can be good in terms of growing leaders and giving them greater, greater uh, sense of responsibility and greater sense of Kind of autonomy in their programs, even though, of course, everything would be coming to, to, the, to Dave at least, and maybe some of that to the board. But I think it's it, it's good to, kind of, uh, free people's hands to think a little bit and maybe ask them to be more accountable for leadership than we might have uh, asked in the past. So Harry, I know this just got smaller when I did this. Well, I know. <laughs> Well, was, this side was the comment that I put there, efficiency and effectiveness, and as you were speaking, I put growing or nurturing, and I don't know if nurturing would be better or just you know, being intentional about it, growing internal leadership within our organization as, a, as maybe an area where we could set a goal. And you know, we have to do that in a way because we're a, we're a smaller BOCES. We're not going to be recruiting leaders from other BOCES probably because we just can't compete in terms of, you know, kind of the entry level salaries or, or whatever else. And what we saw in your organization plan was not to go out and hire a bunch of, you know, outside people to come in and meet our needs, but to look within and find the people who had the, the knowledge and skill and, and, and uh, energy and enthusiasm to do the job and then to put them in, in the, in, you know, in, in the spot where they could best uh, practice their skill. So knowing that down the road, I, uh, you know, every, every, everyone is, you know, the one thing we know in schools is that everything changes. So down the road to be able to 
have a pipeline within our own kind of grow your own uh, leadership pool, I think makes a lot of sense in terms of our sustainability. Anyone else have any any suggestions for Dave and his team uh, regarding uh, the work that he he will be doing for us uh, to draft where we're going to go with our goal statements? Everybody, everybody, okay with this? I just want to get the notes now that I started doing this inventory agencies that support inventory work with agencies that. Support vulnerable populations. Yep. Yeah. teacher and it comes out. Uh, these three areas, it's almost like a Venn diagram where they intersect. Uh, so, you know, you're talking about partnerships, but it's very specific to support, uh, you know, a particular uh, population that, that maybe has been underserved in our region. Uh, but certainly the two, they, they intersect, but I think uh, that this, this framework allows us to have something tangible uh, to, to uh, Okay, anyone else have anything on goal setting before we move on? I think our, what I'm hearing is that Dave will come back to us with an updated uh, draft and then probably uh, September we should be, um, after we've had a chance to process that, we'd be ready to set the goals for the year. Yeah, yeah. What? Oh, someone's talking, go ahead. And what I think, you know, interestingly, what occurred tonight was as we started to talk about something that we thought might fall outside of these areas. Um, we were able to weave right in, and it was logical. So what I would suggest to the board is, as as over the next month, as you're considering um, things you may want to see improved, um, and, and because you can't make it fit in there, we can always leave it outside of it. But then as we talk through it, it becomes more strongly aligned to, to our mission if we do uh, if we do fit it under these, these three categories, these three levers, I think. So. so what I would suggest, if you have any ideas over the course of the month, if you would email those to Dave and he can um, work to see if they can be, be subsumed by some one of, one of the three categories or uh, if they have to exist as some other category. Anything else regarding goal setting? Okay, while well, it's not on our agenda, uh, it typically does that we provide a time for comments from board members. Uh, does anyone have any comments they want to make? I do. Gary, I do. Um, I was interested in the fact that the NISBA convention this year will be held virtually because of the COVID virus, which also made me think that there might be um, some interest in board members who've never had a chance to go to one to find the time to do it virtually from home because that's the way it's going to be presented. It will be including all the aspects that you would uh, experience if you went there. There will be workshops, there will be a, um, a speakers, there will be a keynote speaker, there will be the education expo, and where the 
people who are bringing their ideas for people to learn more about their group. They will be available to answer questions. You can make appointments to talk to them. They'll demonstrate things and have videos to show you about what their products can accomplish. So when I found out, I made a phone call and I talked to someone to see if there had been any um, more detailed planning that what we all received not too long ago in our email. One of the things I learned is that in the next few days, they will be um, sending out additional details on signing up for if you're interested. There's an early bird fee, which is about $260 a person. And then if people don't decide they want to partake in the uh, convention, there's a later fee of about $285. It's not going to be held in one day virtually. It will be held over two weeks at different times on different schedules, which will allow anyone to choose topics they're interested in and still benefit from the um, power of sharing all these ideas and also improving our professional learning. There aren't too many opportunities out there right now for board members to go to training or information Lori was saying everything is virtual i think this might be a good opportunity for those who have not had the opportunity to take part in them i realized that one of the nice things about going in person is the social connection to people from other parts of the state well this may omit that part but the benefits of taking part in the Convention still are worthwhile. And I thought this would give people a chance to think about it. I'll send Christine a phone number that I used that maybe she will provide to you if you want to call someone and ask some questions before thinking about what you might like to do. But I wanted to bring it to your attention because there's still plenty of time to make those decisions. Okay, thanks, Jean. You're welcome. Does anyone? Do we have any other board members who have any comments or things they want to share? Okay, the next item on the agenda is the announcement of our future meetings. Uh, we do have our regular board meeting on August 26th at 5 p.m. I'm believing that we would uh, probably host it in this manner that you know you would have the option to either be in person or be virtual, is that right, Dave? Yep. And then did we anticipate an August, a mid-August meeting? Yes. Uh, well, two things. I see Christine saying it's, it's going to happen. Okay. But technically, the ability to host meetings this way expires on the 5th. Oh. Um, but the closer it gets to it, it's, it's what's happened each month. He, he waits and does it in 30 minutes by he and the governor. And his executive orders 30 minute or 30 day increments. Uh, so as long as he extends that, yes, we can, we can do it that way. Okay. Um, and you know, we, we've talked, I guess it, it, it wasn't one of our organizational goals, but it was something that the board made very clear uh, to, to, to me. And, and, and I felt the same way as did the, the folks uh, that are sitting around these tables right now. Uh, we want to open the school year with as complete a staff as we can because last year was a bit of a struggle. Uh, so what that would allow us to do uh, is, is for the, the, the hiring is, is going pretty well, uh, but we, we may have a couple of additional openings. And there are still a few positions that, that we haven't offered yet. Uh, no one is going to resign from, from their position uh, to come to us without a board approved, uh, approval. Typically for instructional staff, that means 30 days notice. Uh, and, uh, you know, if we can do 30 days notice on the uh, 17th instead of the uh, 26th of August, that gets, gets us nine, nine days sooner. Uh, it would be helpful uh, if we could do a, do a meeting, act on personnel items. I promise I won't plan a long agenda for you. Uh, it just it just would help us get get a more complete staff uh, if we could take care of the personnel items on the 17th. 
So we're saying August 17 for that meeting? If, if, if the board is agreeable, if, if you want to discuss a different date, uh, we could, but that was the executive team felt like that would allow them to, to take care of what's what's out there right now for our can't make any promises if there's another one that comes along. So August uh, 17 at 5 p.m.? Yeah. Is there any interest in having that meeting at your time of the day? I'll be here all day. So, yeah. <laughs> Who's available when? <laughs> I just wondered if anybody was interested in having an earlier meeting time. Well, if we can do it virtually, we don't know that, right? But yeah, as long as we can do it virtually, um, we can. And then that that will get that will get approved. Okay. Is there anyone that objects to a daytime meeting? I can't. No. Well, What's five? Is five is really good for me. Oh. The the good news is that it shouldn't inconvenience anyone too much because I don't anticipate uh, more than a ten minute meeting. I mean, we're going to act on. Um, six or seven personnel items, I think. But it's better to have those six or seven people earlier in September. Yeah. I would prefer five o'clock. Okay. It's easier. I know it's easier for people who have other on their schedule that have to take place during the day. But I thought it was worth asking the question because sometimes it is very, uh, you know, very good to do. Mother told me there are no bad questions. Okay. <laughs> okay, then it looks like we've got a board meeting on August 17 at 5 p.m., 10 minutes. And <laughs> August 26. We won't hold you. I won't hold you that 10 minutes. 15 minutes. I'll give you 11 or 12. <laughs> You're a good fellow. August 26 will be 10 minutes. <laughs> no, that probably won't be. Okay, any other items that come before the board? All right, then Alan. Uh, make a motion the meeting be adjourned. I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Yeah.